I read this book about three years ago that I absolutely loved. I'm not really sure if I've mentioned it before. If I haven't, um, you really are under a moral obligation to read this book. Um, and uh, the book is uh, The Immortal Irishman. Love that book. Did anybody besides myself read that book? Really? You've got to be kidding. Oh, my God. It is a great book. Um, anybody from Montana? Just curious. Is there anybody from Montana here? You better read that book. Because um, in Helena, Montana, they have this huge statue to uh, the mortal Irishman. And his name was uh, Francis Tho sorry, Thomas Francis Maher. And he's born in Ireland, and actually he's born to the upper class, pretty wealthy Catholic family. And he's in Ireland during the Great Potato Famine. Now, his family's really because of their money, that he's safe. But he couldn't stand the fact that hundreds of people are dying. And the English, they're trying to commit genocide. They want the Irish to die. Because, like, the United States sent over food to the dying Irish, and the English made the Irish try and pay for it so they wouldn't get the food. And they demanded that Ireland still export its food to England. They wanted them to die. So uh, Thomas Maher, he can't stand this, and he starts this revolution to try and free Ireland. And, of course, he's captured, and instead of being executed because his family had connections, he was sent to this penal colony um, in like Tasmania, this island, Tasmania or uh, Australia, around there. And uh, he wasn't supposed to have any contact with anybody. Now, just telling you ahead, this is such a great story because this guy, you couldn't kill with a hatchet. Time and time again, he goes up against impossible odds and survives. So he's in this penal colony um, and with the help of pirates, he escapes and comes to the United States. So any story with pirates is a great story. <laughs> then it's the time of the Civil War, and he's actually fairly well known. So Lincoln asks him to be a general in the Civil War. And Thomas Maher, uh, he kind of rallied the Irish to defend uh, black people's lives. And he gives these great speeches where he says, to the Irish, you know what it's like to be oppressed. You know what it's like to be treated as dirt and oppressed. And you couldn't, we couldn't save our own country, but we can save those people. And he rallies the Irish in New York to fight in the Civil War. And at one point, once again, he is in this impossible battle. And he gives this great speech to the Irish. He says what he wants everybody to do is take a sprig of green and put it on them so when they turn over our bodies, they will see that we were Irishmen fighting for other people's freedom. My God, how can you not love this story? Um, and the guy, it's the virtue of somebody who just refused to give up. And he always was on the right side morally of history fighting against oppression. Actually, when he was in Tasmania, he was writing to um, have the um, uh, uh, more equality in Australia. And they used some of his writings for their independence. He was always fighting for other people's independence. Not just the Irish, but the blacks or whoever was getting oppressed. And the man had the virtue of being stubborn, just refusing to give up. So, like, if you know anybody who needs the virtue of some stubbornness, have him read that book. And he becomes one of the first governors of Montana. At that time, Montana is controlled by these kind of crime factions. And once again, Thomas Maher, he goes up against it. He's not going to give in to crime. And actually, they do kill him. But it's such a great story of somebody who, it doesn't matter how much hatred and oppression there is in the world, that man was like a weed. You could not, it was hard to get rid of him. And he was always on the right side morally. And I mention that not only because I just love that story, but um, the story reminds me of my favorite parable in the Bible. This sounds strange. My favorite parable in the Bible is the second one that's mentioned today about the mustard seed. Because the parable of the mustard seed, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. But you have to remember, the mustard seed uh, at that time period was considered a weed. 
because the mustard uh, plant, it takes root in the ground and it really holds its own, so it's hard to get rid of. So the, the mustard seed, it's small, but it's going to form this weed that will not give up. And you have to know that also the mustard uh, plant, it also in the uh, Talmud is used in several recipes for healing. So that sounds kind of strange. So it's hated, but the mustard seed doesn't care. It's this force of healing in the world. That's a lot like Thomas Maher's life. It doesn't matter how much hatred. He's going to hold his own and be the source of healing in the world. And the best part about the parable is that the mustard becomes this tree. And the, the key word is tree. It becomes a tree for all these birds. So what does that mean? And I mentioned before, always in the Bible, a tree is a major theme in the Bible, the third most major theme. You, you open a Bible to any place in the Bible, page in the Bible, and you'll mention, you'll mention something about a tree. The whole Bible, in one sense, is battle between two trees, the tree of life or the tree of selfishness. And the tree of life, it shelters other people's lives. And so the mustard plant becomes this great tree that becomes a place for the birds of the air. Now, the birds of the air symbolize us Gentiles. It symbolizes all the lost and homeless and hurting in the world. The kingdom of God is like this. It's like a people that start out very small, hated, but they're the sheltering tree of healing for the world. We become the sheltering tree for all those who are lost and hurting. We're the tree. Thomas Maher, he was a weed, but also a sheltering tree. That's why I love that story. Um, the parable of the mustard seed, that's my favorite one. Um, and the reason why Jesus is giving these parables is because just before this gospel, he has a run-in with the Pharisees. And the Pharisees say, oh, he's doing all these miracles, healing people by the power of Satan. So then Jesus starts giving these parables. Because the Pharisees, their name Pharisees, means separate ones. That the Pharisees, they think they're going to bring about the kingdom of God by saying, oh, those people there, they're weeds. You need to get rid of them. They want to separate the world from the good from the bad. Um, the parable of the mustard seed means, I don't really care how much you hate me. I'm going to be a force of healing in the world. The, next, the first parable, sorry, is the opposite. Where you have the wheat and the weeds. The wheat is obviously good people. The weeds, the weed is actually here. It's a weed called darnel. And darnel looks exactly like wheat. The only time you can really tell the difference is at harvest time where it changes a different color. And so the parable is, you know, God has this plot of land, that, uh, this farm with wheat in it. And an enemy sows darnel in it, wheat, uh, weeds. And so the servants ask him, well, should we go and start separating the weeds from the weeds? And God says, no, because the roots have mingled together. You pull up what you consider a weed, you might be wrong. And not only will you damage them, but since the roots are mingled together, you're going to destroy a lot of good people too. So, you know, it, sometimes in history and religion, like you'll have the Inquisition, People think, well, I, I know who's orthodox and who's not. And so they start trying to separate. They act like Pharisees. And they damage a lot of other people's lives. All our lives are mingled together. You might consider somebody a weed, but you'll hurt a lot of other people. And so the wheat, the wheat is strong. It can grow up among weeds. It'll be fine. Wait till the... Lord of the harvest comes. He knows who's wheat and weeds, not you and me. And if you're really strong in your faith, then the weeds won't bother you. Um, so that's why like, the first reading kind of picks up that theme where God is so powerful, he can be patient. God is so powerful that he can be merciful. And if we follow God, then we'll be patient. Yes, there's evil in the world, but God is so powerful it will never escape. Um, it's the weak that needs to be unmerciful because they're threatened by everything. The truly strong, 
They're not threatened by anything. They can afford to be patient and merciful. The wheat is supposed to be patient and strong. We're, we will outlast the weeds in this parable. So like, this tendency to start condemning people, that's not the way of the kingdom of God. That's a good parable. Still like the mustard seed better. And the third one is, once again, kind of strange. The third parable is about yeast. And yeast, usually in Judaism, that's once again considered bad. But what if the yeast is actually good? What if the people you consider bad are actually the force of goodness in the world? Uh, that's the point of the parable. And it says it's this woman that measure, puts yeast in three measures of flour. Do you guys know how much three measures of flour is? It's the same amount that Abraham served the strangers. It turns out to be 50 pounds of bread. And she is a baker. Uh, but the point being is that we're the yeast. The world might consider us evil, but we're the thing that makes the bread rise. We're the things that makes it taste good. Um, and so, like, just a, a, an example. One of our parishioners, she just, we had her funeral yesterday. Linda Plattis, you probably don't know who she is. But um, in some sense, like, she was yeast. Yeast is hidden in the dough. You can't separate it. You can't really see it. It's invisible, but it brings about life. And Linda she kind of amazed me because um, she cooked meals for the homeless at uh, Corpus Christi. And she'd cook them in her home and then feed, uh, usually about twice a week, Corpus Christi. And she would feed 180 to 100 people. And she really showed these people love that it would take her three days of preparation of cooking. And she would cook um, a soup, a salad, an entree, and dessert. And a lot of the homeless people said it was the best meal they received uh, all week. And the point being is that she's this example of yeast. Her gift was, she wasn't a, a stubborn as Thomas Maher, but she had the gift of hospitality. She didn't care what people thought of her. She was like yeast. She made life better. So the church is supposed to be all those. And like today, we're going to baptize your child. If she's baptized and your child has Christ running through her, she is part of the tree of life. I hope she inherits Thomas Maher's stubbornness. That she's stubborn. She doesn't care what other people think of her. And she becomes part of this great history of a tree of life that shelters the oppressed. I hope she's like Linda Plattis, where she is hospitable. She makes life better, even if she never gets any credit for it, hidden like the yeast. For all of us, what is the kingdom of God like? Not the Pharisees. And believe me, there are Pharisees alive today who think they have the right to say who needs to be weeded out. Um, we're, we're the weed that turns into the tree of life. We're stubborn and we give life. We shelter those who are hurting and homeless. This is what the tree your daughter will be a part of. And so if you still want your daughter baptized, please come forward with um, your uh, godparents and let us stand and pray for this child.